Hi, friends. Host Eric here, talking with fan people. I'm here with my beloved and spectacular woman friend and wife of all time, Aww. Rachel Lapalosa. <laughs> you may remember her from such live streams as this one from further back than a year ago in the chat. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're still in the chat sometimes, but. Yep. It um, was longer than. Yeah, you were you were around as a participant in the chat for some time before we knew each other personally. Yep, I was known as the ha 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 girl. Ha ha ha. Yeah, because hey. I would laugh at you a lot. I appreciate you laughing at my jokes. It was very gratifying the other morning when you were in the bath and you didn't know I was in the room and I heard you <laughs> laughing at my jokes in the bath. Aww. Yeah, typing questions, <laughs> kinds of typing questions in particular, because I was thinking about this earlier on taking a bath. Um, <laughs> that. If you ask somebody how, depending on what kind of how question you ask, generally they answer it what. So if I were to say, how do you know that, um, how do you know that statement X? People will normally say, like if I say, how do you know this, that was a good movie? Somebody will normally say, well, it, you know, they'll say what they know about it. Well, it's good because meow, it's good because meow, it's good because meow. Um, the thing is, that, of course, is not actually answering the question, how do you know? To answer the question, how do you know, would be, you'd answer it in something in a fashion like, well, I link back to comparable examples. How do I know this movie is good? Well, I link back to comparable examples. Uh, one way I, I know is that I go, this is better than other things in its class. Uh, so I don't expect... For example, that Rachel and I just watched this movie called Whisper of the Heart, and it's way better than than um, Kiki's Delivery Service, which is which is the other the only movie by that guy that I'm familiar with because Delilah watched that movie when she was a kid, um, and I had I watched it with her plenty of times. You know, I'm quite familiar with it. But uh, you sent me an email. Okay. Octavia Silva is somebody who makes me read her emails. Are you are you AAA? I'm sorry. What is that? <coughs> I don't know. Is that what you send me? All right. So when do you find a gift has value? That's an interesting question. Um, so anyway, if you ask somebody, how do you feel about something? They almost always tell you what they feel about it. But... You don't only have to, there are some kinds of questions you could ask how that you're more likely to get a real answer. So if I say, how do you, um, how do you impact situations, which is kind of a question to saying like, do you, are you SE or any, you're more likely to, if, okay. So if I ask each of you the question, how do you prefer to impact situations? What would you say in response? I think most people would probably say, can you explain further what you mean? <laughs> you know, they, they'd, want, they'd want more information before answering that question. <sighs> freedom of the press equals printed written word. Freedom of speech equals spoken word. Um, I mean, I actually don't believe that's the case. I think that the freedom of the press refers to the the uh, right of investigative media to trump the privacy of those they investigate if it's if it's relevant to society stuff in general um, 
I've watched things with MBTI, I have hours of blah versus MB, INFJ, and, and INFJ is what I always end up resonating with, very revelatory information. Well, so that w- that's, another, that's another example of a kind of question one can ask, can of areas. So how do you resonate? You know, it's like, what does it mean to say that you resonate? And the, that's, that's a very N-I verb, uh, as opposed to say, that's what always like, seems the most like me, or um, I, I feel like I'm that or something, I guess. Will, will we see more type police videos? Yeah, for sure. Okay, well, the press wasn't the media in the 18th century. So what do you think it was? Use your phone, sir. Thanks, Charlie. You're welcome. You're saying it, it specifically, okay, you think it specifically says you have the freedom of speech by, by a tools as well. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you, Pee-Pee. I don't see any... Uh... Oh, there it is. I see. There it is. Okay. We were further down than I expected. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, I've got so much more videos than everybody else. Interesting. Views per video. Mine is by far the lowest of all those people. But of course, I do have almost 5,000 more videos than the other person who has the most. So, <laughs> I mean, that's going to bring my average down, right? <laughs> that's hilarious. Thank you for that. I want everybody to see this, okay? Um. <laughs> This is this is great. This is fantastic. I'm gonna push paste. Here. <clears throat> There's notes down below. Okay, let me see. Oh, there are. The top five most popular videos per channel. Sixteen personalities at a job interview. All right. IDR Labs, Casual Cognition, Heart of Mishi. The following factors seem to play into making a successful video covering INTP, INFP, INTJ, or INFJ. I figured that out already. I'm <laughs> number one one already. Yeah, I figured out number two as well. Yeah. I mean, I already understand. Three is says avoid talking about functions or breaking functions down each time they are mentioned. Um, don't be too TI, in other words. Shorter videos tend to be better, although for me, I think my ideal length is about 10 minutes, actually. It's a little bit less, uh, uh, you know, 7 to 10, I guess. Um Yeah, I, I, you also say uh, you should make short, neatly edited videos to give an introduction to your system so that new people coming in on context for what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, this, this is a big, a big pile of mess you're looking at here. So. <laughs> well, listen, here's the thing. Octavia Silva, 
I am going to live stream from now until eight o'clock. At eight o'clock, I got to work briefly with Jeffrey. If you're still uh, awake after that, we should we could maybe meet and um, and discuss a couple of things, and I can add you as a uh, channel manager and stuff like that. Okay. All right, cool. So that'd be about eight thirty, probably. It's supposed to be a short session tonight with my with my student. I knew a probable ESTJ guy in high school reminded me a lot of Damon. If I'm mistyping an ENTJ as anything, it's ESTJ and not ESTP. Yeah, it's I you know I mistyped my dad, who's an ESTJ, as an ENTJ for a long time until I I understood functions better. Um, so to you as well, Alt. I'm so glad to hear that you are not a teenager anymore, Ethan. Congratulations. You're 20 years old. Wow. Can you, I mean, it's like I always forget when, that people are so young. You know? uh, I'll be, I'm a 49-year-old 40, man, and I'll be sitting here yelling at Ethan McDonald. He's like this 19-year-old kid. <laughs> <laughs> and what happens when you're just a name on the internet. It's like I have no, I have no like, physical point of reference to remind me that you're not, you're not eight neutral person entirely you know i tend to probably want to approach everybody as a neutral person not determined by things like their age or their gender or their race or other stupid shit um oh my gosh you're a good day thanks you look very relaxed politics is a charade a pageantry of red and blue gaslighting to provide to gaslighting the public to divide and conquer i don't think there's mm -hmm. gaslighting in the public that would suggest that I, I mean, I think it's 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 a framing war. Um, the tr the public is retarded, and they play this game to enlighten those capable of seeing reality. I mean, I think they play this game because they don't understand an alternative approach that is meaningful. Um, there's 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 a th things like this. Um, I am prone to being outraged by certain things or getting mad about certain things or saying, well, that's not important. Everybody has that quality. The problem is if your feelings and your intuition are screaming at you, these people are wrong, then you tend to think that they're the problem. That instead of there being a shared problem and they are coming up with a wrong solution, you think that they're the problem. The fact is we have shared problems here in America. And we've got two different camps primarily advocating possible approaches. And they seem more concerned about which camp the approach is being advocated from than whether or not the advocacy is the one that's best addressing our shared problem. Teenagers are the real social construct? I, mean, I don't think so. It'll be the 17th. <laughs> um, there's little doubt that Adolescence is, is a meaningful intermediate stage between childhood and adulthood. Let me see what happened here. I want to I want to understand the exchange between email anthrax and lawnmower. No, email anthrax and running fox. I mean, so let's see. Well, if something isn't working, you start over. What do you? How do you hack the system of society? What do you, I think of your question? What is your question, email and anthrax? How do you hack the system of society? That's your question. Okay, and what did Running Fox say as an answer? Let's see. Friend is a four-letter word? Mm, or with a hammer. I see. With a, I mean, you normally don't hack with a hammer. You sort of hack with a machete, but... Email anthrax validates your answer, nevertheless. What do you like? Would you like to elaborate? Well, if something isn't working, you start over. Is that a hammer? Um, what? 
What did your aunt and cousin do? Oh, that story. I'm familiar with it. I'm sorry that happened to you, Lamar. Um, there were no teenagers before Elvis Presley. Wow. Everyone went straight from 11 to 20. Hmm. Amazing. Oh, that is amazing. Oh, nice new haircut, by the way. Oh, you shouldn't be insecure about your body because you've got a good body. That was it. Later on, she takes me saying what she said. I'm currently manufacturing a rubber band ball. Who would like to join my rubber band ball appreciation club? Not me. Destroy the system that isn't working. That was the answer. And it says you have to break society to rebuild it. That's his INTJ answer. Well, um, the thing that we have to break is some bad discursive habits. It's like there's this there's this misconception that somehow there's a system that's responsible for things instead of people. Of course, we're all responsible for things, the way things are, you know? Um, I'm responsible in the sense that I have meaningful words to say that people need to hear, but I'm not doing a good enough job of, of having those spread widely or making my message clear enough for everybody or, you know, provide enough NI as per, as per Octavio Silva's comments. Um, bong rip indeed. Yes. Can I have a... You want me to roll your joint? Please. Sure. Uh, Can you take the bong rip first? Is there anything left in this thing? No, it's a symptom. I poured it all out. I'm okay, here. cool. So we're into our third ounce here. When did we get these this week? Last week. Last week. Okay, so I don't remember exactly what day it was. I think it was... No, I think it was Saturday. Saturday, you're right. Me and Cameron and Rachel went down to the herbarium, and I got three ounces. Um, now, which Saturday was that? That wasn't this past Saturday, no. but the one before. Yeah. So we've had this in, in a week and two days, we smoked two ounces. Pretty good, huh? Yeah, that is pretty good. We're, we're killing it. I know. We're living, living, living large. Thanks, Bay. Now, granted, this isn't the stoniest weed in the world. We went uh, cheaper quantity. In fact, this is what they call premium shake. But it's nice because it's less it's, travel to have to, you know. It's not especially coffee, mm -mm. and um, it does get you high. It it's good for rolling joints, but you know. It's not as nice as smoking bong rips of a nice crisply bud or anything, but nevertheless, I suspect running Fox from this story that she may have wanted to get in on some sort of movement that she felt she was excluded from, probably because of her lack of, you know, she, she doesn't view herself probably as reproductively viable. Which is the the best way to put it, I think, when somebody uh, when somebody has low self esteem related to their uh, related to sex stuff, sex and mating stuff. It's there's a fundamental fear about their own reproductive viability, mm -hmm. and that means they're concerned that the opposite sex doesn't value them as a sex object. Nobody. Like there's all the talk about not wanting to be object, don't objectify women or whatever, but really both types want to be objectified. They want to be conceived of in general as an object of attraction to others rather than yeah. an object of dismissal. <sighs> I'd be very sad. Oh, but uh, right. I'm gonna pull a bowl and then I'll really try. Okay, I was just gonna say next. Year. Yeah, sure, darling. Or if you only pack your bowl, we can pull bowls too. Um. Well, the thing about smoking weed is it's a much different experience if you smoke it every once in a while than if you smoke it all the time. And I don't know what else to say about it. It's kind of the same way for me, actually. If I go a couple of weeks without smoking weed, and then uh, So, you know, probably lawnmower, there's this, there's some sort of weird satisfaction these people get from 
vilifying certain, mm. you know, from from casting aspersion upon villains. And so they've decided to make a villain out of you because they want to vilify you. Uh-huh. Yeah, to be able to that was an accident. Good catch. We did stream on my uh, channel for a hot second. <laughs> Ooh, I'm feeling it. I'm a little gamey right now myself. Right. Yeah, I, I bathed this morning. <coughs> yeah. Well, <coughs> yeah. Neither of us are are natively inclined to uh, put on deodorant every day. <laughs> wow. <laughs> After my, I still haven't put on. I haven't put on deodorant in weeks. <laughs> Good for you. Weeks, I haven't smelled you in weeks. You know, it's not actually true. I had put put on deodorant more recently than that because one time I wanted to have sexual intercourse with you, but I didn't want to wash my whole body, so I just washed my undercarriage. And then when I got out of the washing bathroom, washing my undercarriage, I realized my pit stank, so I put on some deodorant before I went and had oh. sexual intercourse with you. Thank you, Ray Ray. That's really the only reason to have sexual intercourse is if it's gonna your stink is gonna bother other people. I don't think even when I'm stinky, it particularly bothers Rachel because I it know doesn't. that when when she's gaming, it doesn't bother me at all. We we sort of naturally feel um, very comfortable with each other's gaminess. <laughs> yes, uh, which is a good indication that you're biologically compatible. It is. I've never like I enjoy host Eric's scent so much. And it's so not um, invasive that I, it, it is a weird chemical attraction, attraction thing that I have never experienced before. <coughs> yeah. So, like, I like to compliment on it. Yeah, we, we seem to be naturally aligned to each other's pheromones. Yeah. And that's not always been the case with me. My first wife, it's like the smell thing is, as the best corollary I can think of for in terms of relationships in the past in my life. Um, Me too. The only two girls I, that I really thought smelled good, like fully, were my first girlfriend and Rachel. Oh. You might want to light this, light this, this end. Thank you. Oh, I see. I, it was meant to be lit the other way around, but then I, I had to tear off that end because it got a little meowy. Yep. Ooh. Here, I'll let you do it. Yeah. Um, okay, what are your opinions on each other's breath stink in the morning? I don't ever smell her breath. Really? But, well, first of all, so glad. Rachel's an odd sleeper. Um, <laughs> she prefers to sleep on the floor, on the side of the bed. And there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> you know, I, I find it's more comfortable in bed when we're not in the same bed. Uh, but I think maybe we both like to be in the same room sometimes. Oh, I love you know? it when you're in the room. I love it. The mornings are so pleasant. Canna Bear says, last girlfriend said I always smell like sunshine. Mm. See, I... um. I hate the smell of sunshine. I know sometimes my breath is kicking because, like, I we drink a lot of coffee, so like, I know that I have coffee breath. Sometimes. I mean, I can honestly say, Rachel, I have never wow. once noticed your breath at all. Oh my gosh, I honestly don't notice your breath either, and this is a lot. I mean, especially with me, <laughs> I've got, I've, I not only drink a lot of coffee, I also smoke a lot and brush my teeth intermittently. So yeah, but I never when we go to kiss, I. <laughs> Never smell your breath. <laughs> I, I have also noticed my cat's breath before too. I, one time, K Kitty came in and was pushing, going to push her head, face against mine. I was like, "Oh my god, what are you been rubbing on your face?" <laughs> oh my gosh, the relationship that you have with PP is so funny. I would point out that all three of you are S, E, and N, I. So maybe that is an S, E, and I thing that's sleeping on places other than beds. I don't know. 
mean, you share with Sean and Octavio. The one thing oh. all three of you share, function wise, is you're both on the N NISE axis. So that could be. I mean, it's. I always said that, uh, like at home in New York, like I wanted to get a futon, like sleep like a Japanese person, and no one understood. They were like, "No, bed frame," and I was like, "But you guys don't get it. Like I'm actually more." Because I think my posture and stuff is, like, really terrible from... You want a firm surface, I can tell. Yeah. We have kind of a soft bed. Um, also cool, too. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, can, I can feel that, Octavia. So if I were to be described as either... If I had to pick one agoraphobic or claustrophobic, I definitely pick agoraphobic. I've never been bothered by being crammed into small places. I always find it kind of cozy and soothing. Womb-like. In fact, for years after I was born, I'd climb back up into my mother's womb to sleep at night. Just my nose sticking out of her vagina so I could breathe. Later, as I got a little older, I put a straw. I've got a straw in the mix, like a snorkel. I made it even easier. She was a party girl herself. In fact, she would go out dancing with her friends to clubs and leave her husband and daughter home years ago. Hmm. Sorry to say. I feel like a dog where smell is most connected to memory than other sense. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit more about the original topic here, which is kinds of typing questions. Um, so, you know, if you think about them in terms of their, their functions, you'd say, well, how do you know? How do you deliberate? How do you impact? How do you interface, you know? The thing is, for most of those questions, if you ask them, if you ask somebody, how do you interface or how do you impact, you'll either get a request for a clarification or an actual answer to that question. Whereas if you ask somebody, how do you know, you'll get instead what they know. And if you ask, how do you, uh, how do you feel, you'll get what they feel. And if you ask, how do you think about this? Um, people will go, what do you mean, how do I think? You mean, what do I think? <laughs> uh, and they go, no, how do you think about this? Oh, okay, well, I think about this by referencing a, a set of abstractions that I already have that are related to this, and yeah, 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 right? Uh, but most people would find the question odd to say, how do you think about this? Now, if we ask the question, how do you feel about something, it means exactly the same thing as, what do you feel about something? So there doesn't seem to be any way meaningfully to talk about how you feel about something, at least from my abstract perspective, except what I came up with is how does, how does your emotional feelings make your body physically feel different? So mm. if, if you were asked, how, do, how does crying make your body feel different? I'd say, well, you get this tightness in your throat kind of a thing mm -hmm. and your face gets wet from tears sometimes it even stings your eyes from the tears <laughs> <You're> <laughs> it's hard to get your breath yep <laughs> yep oh the pee so that's how you feel right but um really that's saying can you tell me how you si when you fi Hi. Or can you tell me what SI experiences you have when you FI? Wow. It was always the case for me that one of the first emotions that I remember linking clearly to a, a physical feeling was um, about to go compete. About to go compete always created in me a uh, metallic taste under my tongue. I started noticing as soon as I started doing uh, speech and debate competitions that every time there'd be a tournament, I'd have this weird coppery metal taste under my tongue especially and it would maximize right before around you know and i realized oh that that must link to excitement or something like that or anticipation i wasn't i didn't spend much time thinking about feelings when i was a kid because that's just what it means to be fi polar 
I don't remember thinking about my feelings at all, really. No, I I didn't bite my tongue. I just it just tasted metallic underneath it. Like I don't know how else to describe it. It's this weird like storm about to break kind of feeling or taste. How might polar T E convert into S E? Well, let me let me ask you this. Let me let me tell you an example from the car. So I asked Rachel, um, Let's say you're the vice president of a company and Julie runs up to you and says, there's a, there's a problem. There's a big problem in the women's bathroom. Um, the toilets are overflowing. And I give you one more piece of information. If you call the plumber, you'll get in trouble with your boss, the president. And then I asked her, now, what do you need to know about, what do you need to know in order to correctly, to successfully solve this problem? Okay, think about this for a second, right? So Rachel said, okay, well, I need to know about the personnel I have in the, in the business. <laughs> Basically thinking still, um, I'm going to figure out who's best to solve this problem, yeah. right? Which is a logical enough approach. But what do you actually need to know, given all the information I've told you? Anybody have any thoughts? Anybody want to engage with this before I explain it all? Anxiety makes you get rashes. Let's all go scare running fox. No. And then count the rashes. <laughs> not rations. rations. Oh, not rations. Oh, my bad. Well, it's better than lashes. No, I know you. I just want to make it clear for the audience. Running fox, if anxiety made you get lashes, then you'd be whipped every time you were scared of being whipped, and that would really be a vicious circle. Right, yes. Octavia Silva. So here's the scenario again. You're the <coughs> vice president of a company, and Julie's run up to you and has um, had told you there's a problem in the women's bathroom and the toilets are overflowing. One more piece of information I'll give you is that if you call the plumber, you get in trouble with your boss. So what do you need to know to solve this problem? There's one correct answer. Or variants of it, you know. Can anybody give me the correct answer? Euler? Euler? No. Interesting, Rachel didn't get this either. Are you guys all what type are you? It seems like an easy TE question. All right, I'll ask the question again. Yeah, exactly, Chris Chapman. That's the answer. You need to know why you got in trouble. Why you'd get in trouble if you if you call the plumber. And you weren't paying attention, Sean O'Neill, that's why. Because you weren't paying attention, Ronnie Fox. I said it twice. That's why. So the question is this. <laughs> well, that's right. You're getting scolded. Um, the question was this. You're, you are the vice president of a business. And you, Julie runs up to you. She's one of the employees in this business. And she says, there's a problem in the women's bathroom. The toilets are overflowing. Here's another piece of information. If you call the plumber, you're going to get in trouble with your boss. Well, what do you need to know to solve this problem? INFJ. I love about this. Why is this a vice president thing? No, the answer is why you got in trouble. Why, why would you get in trouble for calling the plumber? In other words, you need to know the protocols um, by which this sort of problem is fixed in your company. So knowing why you would get in trouble would explain to you 
the frame you need to understand in order to solve the problem. That's a decent TE there to understand that, I guess, because a lot of people don't don't immediately grasp that that's the missing element. I would note that email answer is an INFJ like Rachel, and he said the condition of the toilets. Um, Rachel said you need to know the skills of all the people in your company, um, which would be true if you could assume that getting in trouble for calling the plumber means you're not going to get in trouble if you don't mm. call the plumber, but you can't assume that. I'm not saying it's necessarily the case. It's just I'm curious if this function of the TE kind of a problem or not. So, okay, Danny, see, here's the thing. There are some ways in which INFJ and ISJ will answer much the same. So being TE polar, for example, is going to play out kind of similarly for both of them. I would say that one example of TE polar and ISFJ is even though they are a lot, they're likely to cook a lot, like an ISFJ will do this. Okay, this this recipe requires one cup of ketchup, one half cup of mayonnaise, um, one uh, uh, fourteen walnuts shelled. Uh, so she'll get out like a plate or a bowl for each of those ingredients, so that she can dirty as many dishes as possible. Apparently, right? That's TE polar and an ISFJ. It's one example of it. Where TE Polar and INFJ, they're probably not going to really be into cooking and shit like that anyway. They are they would like the SI. They would love a world in which, um, you know, basically they never had to feed themselves or bathe themselves. Or that was always just sort of attended to by yeah. somebody else, yeah. maybe. Or just not really attended to, not, not being pushed, not being controlled by anybody else in it, but just sort of relieved of it, you know? You know it's, I know, though, from myself... If we had a little like kitchenette in here, I'd probably make some eggs or something. I, I bake it, I would definitely make. I'd do the easy, easy grill it like pan kind of stuff. <coughs> but um, would I be enjoying it every day? No. No. It's one thing that. Um, ISFJs comfortably fall into steady routines and are. <laughs> are not likely to have difficulty with following through on that steady routine on a regular, on the regular basis. Right. Yeah. Whereas INFJs are going to not be comfortable being locked into any sort of steady routine where they, the expectations are that they continually attend to matters of the mundane. When I took the VIA uh, test, it said that one of my lesser strengths was perseverance. Yeah. That's what, it's one of mine too. Um, I know I had a roach. That was more than a roach somewhere. What did I do? Um, it's not here, I don't think. Oh, I got it. I'm not sure how I survived so long. I forget to eat and drink constantly. Uh, you know, Rachel and I don't, I think, forget exactly, but we tend to go, oh, that's right, I'm hungry. Okay, well, we'll deal with that after this. And then, you know, two hours later, oh, wait, I'm still hungry, I never dealt with it. Like, uh, and, and this this sort of thing is something that happens all the time in both directions. Either I'll say meow and then not do it, or she'll say meow and then not do it. So <laughs> it's like earlier, she's she's all, I think I'm gonna, I want to get some um, frozen burritos. I'm I'm hungry. Go for it, you know, that sounds good. Uh, I told her, just remember, because I know her TE is poor, so I go, just remember, it's uh, two and a half burrito, two and a half minutes per burrito. Uh, so she's like, and I'm doing two, so five minutes, and yeah, five minutes. Okay, cool. He actually said five minutes because I had no action to the math. Okay, so um, <laughs> this is an extraordinarily honest of you. See, I, this is the sort of thing that I'm aware before I say that. Um, I'm trying to sort of roll into it in a way that expresses it neutrally without saying, Aww. without revealing that thing right there, you know? <laughs> no, <laughs> but um, yeah. she's, this is the thing. I, I have never encountered, there's been a couple of occasions where I, at some point, like, told a lie, and then, like, months later, uh, says something contradictory to it, and she'd be like, didn't you one time say, man, man, 
<laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess I was lying when I said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it happens very rarely. But it's very nice rarely. to know that um, the reason it happens very rarely is because I tell so know, very right? few lies. Because, if I mean, even the teeniest little thing, it, it's anathema to her. So yeah. I appreciate that. It's It's great. It's like... You know what what she values. It's, it makes it easy to trust. I guess it's normal for low SI people to be easily thin. Skinny people generally don't realize how low their caloric intake is. My caloric intake is not low. Uh, it's it it vacillates a lot. Like the last few days, maybe my caloric intake has been fairly low. But even then. Like when Rachel and my dad and I sat down to have Panda the other the other day, I finished most of my two item thing, most of all the food in it. I just had some rice, a little bit of rice. Maybe I didn't finish the whole thing. Even I don't remember exactly, but you had some rice. Left I have, I have a little rice left over. Yeah. Um, whereas Rachel had enough for two meals. My dad had enough for two meals. I'm six foot four. You do need a lot of caloric intake, though. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, I am. I'm, I don't deny that I'm wrong about some stuff. The thing is, I would point out that what I do deny is that anybody has adequately explained to me why I'm wrong about something that I'm persistently wrong about, and I won't. I will cease persistent being wrong about that when somebody does adequately explain to me why I'm wrong. I, I don't claim to be able to to intuit everything. There are some times where I'm going to be wrong and not going to be able to intuit it myself. And in those circumstances, I'm going to have to rely on somebody else to correct me. But um, if they themselves can't explain why I'm wrong, then they can't really correct me. So yeah. in, that, in those circumstances, I will persist in being wrong for a while. Uh, however, I would say it's... Uh, Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, it's it's usually not difficult actually to convince me that I'm wrong is not difficult. The thing that's extremely difficult is to convince me that I'm wrong when I'm not. That's almost impossible. Danny C asks, how many differences between the INFP and ENFP? Yeah, I know it was insanity. That Marty Glenn stream was insanity. I watched, I, I think I watched that whole thing. I, I made it. I, I watched the premiere of it, but then I was commenting in the premiere in the chat, and then I rewatched it again. So I watched that whole thing three times. All right. I mean, I watched it. I actually only watched it once. That's the weird thing, is because, like, I, the first time when you're making it, you're not watching it. The second time when I'm, Talking to chatters, I'm not really watching it. It's like you guys, when you're talking to each other, don't hear what the hell I'm saying. And so I had this great question, this big like thing set up, and then everyone's like, what, were you talking, Eric? I'm like, ta-da! And they're like, what are you doing over there? Are you doing something? Like, what, you're not even paying attention? Come on! You're ruining my trick! <laughs> Trigger the chat. That is triggered. Uh, I mean, email anthrax is, is saying something was meant to trigger the chat. Uh, <laughs> of course it was. He's such a rascal. So, um, the comment center is, I don't even want to see it. <laughs> the people, the, com the people in the comments on his channel are so wild too. They're like, well, Eric just doesn't understand he's an INFJ Virgo. Oh my gosh, it's so funny. Okay. <laughs> um, it was it was rather exhausting. Uh, not not exhausting. It was rather. I, I would say rather than calling it exhausting, Brad, it was rather filling 
filling. It was a rich food. By the time I was done with the whole process, I felt like I was full of stuff to process. I didn't need to. I didn't. I wasn't bored. Maybe. Massive, massive boobage. <laughs> Utter self wants lawnmower to picture Utter self as a hot girl with massive boobage. Ah. Now, I would like to talk about a show that's both, and you wouldn't normally think this, right? That's both um, uh, what's that word? With, gratuitous. It's gratuitous with its use of boobage. But is nevertheless one of the most intelligent and deeply impacting shows I've seen in a long time, and that is Blue Exorcist. Yeah. But they have they definitely aren't shy with the boobage in that. You've got Not a couple of characters, all. right? Yeah, a couple of characters. So it's revealed that the blonde girl has boobage. Yeah, and then and the, the ghost in the in the amusement park. Goes to the amusement park, who's like a little kid ghost, comes up to her, like pretending to cry, and she oh, cries yeah. with the little kid ghost against her boobs. And then the little kid ghost pushes on her boobs, like this. Ah, ah, ah. And and then Ren says, Oh, I wish I could grab them too. <laughs> he mumbles to himself, oh, you know. It's so good. <laughs> that's true. All I'm gonna agree with that statement in general. I think what? that's generally true. Men of intellect prefer boobs to ass. I think so, too. Are we high-fiving? Yeah. What have I not responded yet? Who hasn't responded to what? Oh, I didn't notice. No, I'm I'm trying not to think beyond the boundaries of my own domain here because, uh, as I indicated over the course of yesterday, it's it's very easy to make me feel guilty about hurting people's feelings. Because I know I'm prone to not thinking about it at all. And I know that I'm subject to those critiques. So, uh, well, actually, I, I mean, to be honest, now that I, it just sort of hit me that I've been processing this thing, uh, I realize I feel like I am now equipped to do type police. I feel like I am equipped to to be more successful at being not so not subject to reproach. Like I didn't think I was particularly subject to reproach this time. Okay. Now, okay. Octavia Silva, you just asked an important question because I wanted to make officially announce that in the stream, in fact, and talk about it a little bit. Somebody else in the comments put down ESFP possibly and um, asked basically what Octavia Silva said. And my response was, actually, you're right. I think... Uh, I think he could be an ESFP. Who? Uh, Marty Glenn. Oh. So the thing is, what I'm pretty convinced that of, in fact, what I'm 100% convinced of is that he's TI polar. But he may actually not be an ENFP. He may be an ESFP. The amount of tattoos would say that. I don't know a lot of. Uh... But what Octavia Silva says here is correct as well. It's a four or five thing. I've often said you should never try to distinguish people on the four or five. You'll get confused. And what I was doing is trying to distinguish people on the four or five there. Uh, I see the weak eye all over the place since his COVID okay. shit, right? That's textbook ESFP, that COVID shit. But then I saw him providing SI when I, in circumstances that I thought demanded TI. And uh, I thought, well, that's textbook ENFP. And I just didn't really, I don't know. I guess I just didn't really consider ESFP. I, I would at this point say the correct typing of him is he's either ESFP or ENFP and probably more likely ESFP. Mm -hmm. I see that. <laughs> <laughs> Email antics is not a bad idea. What? Typology court. Ooh, I like that. Um, it, it would be Interesting if we had like so sort of typology law and order, uh, which is to say, first there's the the police part where um, like 
me or me and Rachel go and sort of investigate, look at some clips and uh, mm -hmm. make that like five minutes long. And then we talk like, or write music to myself either way. Um, well, I guess there's enough to take you in. We'll see. You know, I'm placing you under arrest and we'll see. Uh, we'll see how, um, how, uh, what the judge thinks about it, you know, <laughs> what the, what the, but the judge or the court courtroom. thinks about it. The courtroom yeah, thinks about it. You know? that's a great idea. And then go and bring it to you and see if they're actually guilty or not. Um, I mean, the thing is, um, thank you for noting that you the SVU thing. I thought that was clever when I thought that too. <laughs> that was funny. Say <laughs> <laughs> please SVU. Yeah. <laughs> Where did I put my cigarettes? Over there. So I've only got a few minutes left here um, before I got to work with, I got eight minutes or so, before I got to work with my client, Oscar. Oscar Norlander. I like your name, Oscar Orland Norlander. Call Norlander. Get his ass up here. Yo, Oscar! Oscar! The boss wants you! Get up here! What? Oscar Norlander? Yeah? Come here. We've got a mission for you. Why? Because you've got a very poetic name. Our heroes need to have the right name. So when we tell stories about them, they aren't named something like uh, Quincy... Quincy Pusaram, you know, <laughs> nobody wants their hero named Quincy Pusaram. We need our heroes with good manly names like Oscar Norlander. I won't, Octavia Silva. 8.30. Getcha. Eric makes for a fantastic wizard when he sees this language design beyond maritime admirality legalese. Hmm. That's a confusing sentence. Yeah. I mean, do you really need to have a subset of maritime called admiralty? Like, aren't all stations in the set under the set of maritime hierarchy slots equally subject? Or does, it, or does it originate from the Admiral? First name sounds Mexican. <laughs> I've heard that. Lonmar, Lonmar says, first name sounds Mexican, last name sounds Nordic. But I read it when I first saw it as, first name sounds Mexican, last name sounds moronic. I was going to say, what are you talking about? Norlander's a great last name. Mm -hmm. Oscar Norlander. We have come for you. You shall not take me. I am Oscar Norlander. King of the North, Queen of the South, Prince of the West, Princess of the East. They call me the Royal Family, Oscar Norlander. Really? I didn't know that. It is definitely a TV title or something. Oscar Norlander. Yeah, it might be a character from something. You know who my favorite ENTJ character is? I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell everybody who my favorite ENTJ character is that I can think of. And maybe I, maybe I will later go, oh, actually, that person. No, no, no. But for now, as far as I can tell, my favorite is Lil Brows from Blue Exorcist. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember what her other name is, but her name's Little oh. Brows. She's got these little teeny, little teeny eyebrows, just like this. Triangle. Little, yeah. I can find a, a link to a picture of her, possibly. ISCP characters. Okay, so I was thinking that the the guy in the uh, in Whisper of the Heart is an ISCP. Um. 
Right. And that, and that, and then he's like, you know, no, I'm going to ride to the top of this hill with you on the back. You know, he's seeking sort of cheap FE, like, you're so big and strong. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Strudel. I've been nicknamed that by people in the past, actually. Uh, maybe about one person in one context. Uh, CPT explanation of the first third functions of all types. Pretty in-depth description of FI and SI versus NETE. Don't. Whatever you do, <laughs> don't take off your hat. The okay. demons in here are particularly attracted to a full head of hair. You're safe, Eric, but... Oh, we're at risk. Um. It's like the peg demons and the peg lanterns in uh, Blue Exorcist. They're attracted to women. They want to eat them. They want to burn them up, actually. They don't want to eat them. They want to burn them up as fuel for their lantern. And so they chase after uh, Big Ted, what's your name? The, the one who's got a crush on Ren. And so that's how they get us across the river. Pretty sneaky. Soul from Breaking Bad and ENTJ. Soul? No, Soul's an ENTP. Don't you think so? Yeah, from Never Call Soul. Uh, Better Call Soul? Yeah, he's an ENTP. Yeah, I think I think he is too. I I I probably I may have even known enough about personality type when I watched that show way back in the day to know that he was an ENTP. I mean, I, I I had heard about MBTI by then, I enough to go that's an ENTP character. The real one really interesting question about that show, Breaking Bad, is what's the what's the type of the chicken guy? He's one of the more interesting characters I can think of off the top of my head in in my TV watching history. The chicken guy, whoever that actor is, he he was really it's like when he first appeared on screen in that show, I was like, him? Why pick him to play this character? Yeah, the chicken guy, the pollo guy, the drug lord who, um, who, Mister White blows up when he goes to visit the yeah Gus. <clears throat> In- interesting actor, right? Very like draw something about him draws your attention. So anyway, uh, INTJ. That's that's probably. But isn't generally Mr. White also typed typed INTJ? I never watched Californication. Um, no, I mean INTJ. It makes no sense to be honest. For Gus, I always thought Mr. White was generally typed INTJ, but yeah, uh, doesn't seem quite right to me. They type um the Apollo Loco guy INTJ. Is that in both INTJ? Mm-hmm. Walter White's probably ISTJ. Hmm. I I would agree. Yeah. That he if we were to say why are if, if Mr. White and Gus are different types, what's what are they or why or what are, which which one which way does that go? Then I agree with that that Walter White's. The ISTJ and Gus the INTJ. Thank yeah. you, Sean, for that's such excellent FE and hey, good SI too, there, Mister. Yeah. Good SI. I was I actually remembered, but thank you anyway. I appreciate it because it was a good chance I wouldn't have. Goodbye, everybody. Don't forget to eat <laughs> plenty of cheese. <laughs>